Hey, everybody. Fascinating and important to topic today as we talk about transforming healthcare operations with AI-powered insights at teletracking. Michael, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Evan? Great. Thank you very much. Great to see you here. Um, before we dive in, maybe introduce yourself, a little bit about your background and what teletracking is and does exactly. Cool. Yeah, so I lead the product management organization here at Teletracking. I've been here about four years. I've been in healthcare, probably about 15 in total. Mm. So I actually got into healthcare uh, through the pharmacy side, working at McKesson on uh, robotic automation and pharmacies. Mm. And uh, Teletracking is different space. So we're more in the movement of patients through their care journey. So it's not the delivery of care itself, right? We're not a, a clinical system that people use to deliver care, but making sure they, they're in the right place, they have access to the right um, things that they need, whether that's you know equipment or people or whatever it is. Well, important topic as we're all patients and caregivers in we different are. ways. Uh, so from your standpoint, what are the biggest pain points hospitals and healthcare systems facing today? There are many. Yeah. I guess, but what's top of mind for you and how do you help? Yeah, we think um, one of the big, it's a historic problem and that they've always been battling is length of stay. So mm. one of the challenges is, and if you look at it over the long term, I mean, you know, going back to the 60s, people used to be in a hospital for 20 plus days. That was not. Wow. Treatment. Today, you're averaging around five to six days in terms of length of stay. But every hour, every day that you can shave off of that, is another uh, patient that you can get in a bed. So that's less patients that are waiting in the ED to get admitted or you know, get a step down from PACU, whatever that looks like. But freeing up that those beds, which are essentially their capacity is, is a big part of what we focus on. That's interesting. I've read you've been compared to the air traffic control for patients, which <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a great analogy these days, I apologize. But what, what does that mean exactly? What's the technology behind that that makes that even possible? Yeah, so if, you know, if our solutions kind of break down into a couple different categories. One is around access. So how do patients get to the site where they're going to get the care that they need? Mm. And so that's where the tra air traffic control comes in, right? When somebody's got to be in the tower directing traffic to keep everything safe. So on, you know, last year we had, or we processed almost 3 million transfer cases through our system. So those are patients getting to some location for critical care, for acute care that they need, uh, whether that's being transferred from another hospital that can't provide the services that are needed or somebody that was in an accident or, you know, whatever the circumstance is, making sure that they're getting to the right place that will have the services and the equipment that they need to get the care they need. So that's kind of the air traffic control part. But when you think about mm. the analogy, if you carry it a little further, when the plane gets to the gate, what's the big thing they have to do? <laughs> Clean the plane, turn, get new passengers on board and get mm. it out, right? So that's the other part of how do you ensure that that capacity is being fully utilized? If every plane sat outside the gate for 20 minutes or half an hour while being incredibly frustrating, if you're the traveler, that's also money, right? There are patients that are waiting to get on the next flight to get to their destination. So the other part of our solutions are helping ensure that those seats are turned, those beds are turned, that the work is getting done so the next patient can be ready to go. Yeah, and enter AI, your... Um a big user developer of AI technology, maybe talk yep. about how your models are trained and developed and what are the kind of inputs that are essential to get the results that you're describing? Yeah, so if you think about it, you know, at a, a hospital level, we train our models based on the facility's own data, the unique aspects of how they operate, the th services they provide, hours, whatever it is, all of those things that are unique to that site need to be factored into their to their models. If we trained at a even a system level or regional level, you would get probably a lot of discrepancies. It wouldn't be meaningful in the in the care setting where you're trying to affect change. So we do train all everything at the facility level. While we're not a clinical system, we do rely on clinical signals. So um, we just launched a new product recently called Decision IQ 
one of the things that we're doing is helping prioritize discharge activity and mm. orders are an important part of understanding you know how ready is a patient to go and by orders i mean do you have outstanding labs or imaging or whatever it might be right those are all signals of where you are in your care journey amazing uh and so you also leverage generative ai in different scenarios um, how do you separate the uh, challenges of of gen ai hype in the public uh, sphere versus delivering you know impactful results in hospital use cases what there's a big difference there i think uh you're probably grappling with yeah i think it's and this is true of any technology right if you're not solving mm -hmm. real world problems that people are willing to pay for whether it was generative ai or robotics then you're probably you know in left field and need to think about it but when you think about generative specifically i you know it's moving so fast it's, it's, it's really somewhat overwhelming for our customers to think about. But I think there are categories of, of where that can be applied that you will see adoption much sooner than others. So for example, um, there's actually a company based here in Pittsburgh where we're located called Abridge, which is um, all about clinical documentation. So mm. you know, doctors and nurses didn't go to school to sit in front of a computer and type into forms. So if technology can listen to their conversation with a patient and capture the necessary documentation, it saves them a ton of time and a lot of frustration of having to, to do that work manually. You take that to more of the decision support space, which is kind of where we are today. Um, it's gonna probably be a little bit slower. While technology could technically do a lot, we have a lot of conversations with our customers. I'm sure you've heard the term human in the loop right how do you keep people part of the process because i think there's a, a level of trust that needs to be established for them to be able to turn over some of that decision making to technology especially given what they do right they're they're caring for people's lives so this these are there's real consequences if you get it wrong indeed yeah really important work being done there and when it comes to use of ai in general can you share any unexpected benefits, surprising results, anecdotes that you've seen so far from using AI in hospital operations? Um, a couple of things. One is you, we. One of the things we've seen is kind of the um, an unexpected ability to like increase just things like situational awareness by mm. us predicting things, sharing those predictions in a certain context around when they're making decisions about, let's say, discharge activities. By sharing that information across all the different service lines or disciplines within the hospital, you save the nurse from you know, spending an hour or so on the phone calling six or seven departments to make sure mm. their patient gets the x-ray it needs, their patient gets the lab work it needs, because everybody knows what you're trying to do. Um, Probably the other thing is just the tooling itself, our ability to move with pace as this as these tools and technology mature is just it is ultimately going to change the landscape for everybody. Oh, it's a fantastic opportunity all around. You also recently announced a partnership with Palantir, who are known for their analytics and AI uh, horsepower. What's that all about? What are you hoping to deliver together? Yeah, so. If you think about it, we've been doing this for 35 years and we understand a lot about how hospitals work and how they should work um, and how you can optimize different kinds of processes. A byproduct of that is we were forced to be technology providers, right? We develop tools and as the industry progress, we progress with it. And with Palantir, you now have, we now have access to a best in class platform. You know, they are, they have developed some amazing tools that free us from, you know, some of the things that just aren't value added in our world. The value of, of our team thinking about Mongo databases and, you know, <laughs> all those AWS services that people talk about, that there's very little value add. If we can outsource mm. that work to someone like a Palantir and build on top of their platform, which has incredible security, has incredible you know, data manipulation and AI capabilities. It just lets us move faster and expand into other areas. Well, it should be a, an amazing game changer for hospital capacity management. 
And you must be also looking at a lot of other technologies beyond AI from the Internet of Things or 5G, digital twins. I'm just imagining the opportunities to influence mm-hmm. hospital operations. What's on, what else is on your radar, if you could share a peek? Yeah, so the, uh, the, the product I mentioned just a minute ago, Decision IQ, that actually is built off of um, a computational twin framework that we partnered mm-hmm. from a partnership with a company actually in the UK called Faculty. And uh, that lets you, if you think about it, predicting things is interesting, but when someone's making a decision, how do you understand the trade-offs of that decision, the consequences of that decision? And so what their technology does, and I'm sure you're familiar with computational twins, they've been around for a while and used in aerospace, Formula One, all these industries, right, where these systems are governed by the laws of physics. So you can predict how those things would perform in different conditions hospitals are made of people and they're very unpredictable Mm. (laughs) right but you can use data to observe how they perform how they behave build that into a computational twin and then ask questions like if i prioritize you know my ed over my pacu how's that going to impact my overall flow through the hospital today they just try things and see what happens So this would give them the chance or the opportunity to contemplate different scenarios and different ways of behaving and operating. Amazing. And speaking of, you know, planning for the future, any advice for hospital leaders, healthcare IT leaders in preparing for all these emerging technologies, this wave of transformation, uh, even implementing solutions like yours? What are what are some of the best practices you've seen to get things to work? Um, I think it's there's a couple things to that. One is we're seeing a lot of customers that really weren't prepared. So they're putting governance councils in place to evaluate things that are trying to come into their environment. Mm. And that takes time, right? You're introducing friction to the process. So the customers that have been able to move faster are the ones that leverage things that they already have in place. So if I have a data governance council, I already have established set of people that are used to working together. They have a way of working. Can you add AI to that, right? So instead of spinning up something completely new to your organization and getting that going, leverage things you already have in place. Um, And the other thing is just you have to establish a level of trust with this, just like any other system, right? So people, a lot of it comes back to data and traceability. And if people understand what's underneath and how it works and what it's doing, that will go a long way to speeding adoption. That's so exciting. My only advice would be, please hurry up. We all need this for our family members, (laughs) loved ones, friends, colleagues who we, you know, visit in the hospital and and see the reality today. Uh, What does the future look like in the next year or two in terms of patient flow? You know, what are you excited about as you look at your roadmap and what's next? Yeah, we've, I mean, our mission since we started the company, I wasn't here 35 years ago, but it's remained consistent. No patient ever waits for the care they need, right? That's what we're trying to do. And I think the, what excites me, and what we're focused on is just like I talked about with the bridge, how does technology move into the background to let clinicians focus on care delivery? Technology has kind of got in the way of a lot of that. So you have a you know, physician sitting in a room with a patient, but they're looking at their computer screen typing. That, that dynamic needs to change. It needs to change mm. every aspect of care delivery. So that's what we're excited about. Well, amazing work. Congratulations on all of the success and onwards and upwards. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you. And thanks, everyone, for listening, watching, sharing. This episode, be sure to check out the new TV show on techimpact.tv on Bloomberg and Fox Business. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone.